So we're going to move on to the keynote speaker here. Uh, it is my uh, honor and privilege to uh, uh, announce uh, my friend Camille Cruz here. He's a, uh, a long friend. I've uh, known him since the eighth grade. And uh, when I heard about this project being started, uh, it was just a, a whisper behind me. Dr. Sue was talking to Paulina, and they had mentioned reintegration and, and working with the formerly incarcerated. And, and lo and behold, my friend's face came to my mind. Uh, we had met in Washington. Uh, I was on vacation. Uh, I had just graduated, and I was rewarding myself. And he was out there uh, presenting the, the new justice reforms that uh, Los Angeles is going to be put together. And we, we just ran into each other. And, we started getting to talk about this population in particular. Um, I it's a little bit hard. This is an old time friend of mine who's going to almost make me cry to, to actually start to uh, award and nominate him here. Uh, Camilo, I'm just going to let you speak for yourself. And uh, I'm going to bring him up right now. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Keith, for being who you are. Thanks, Dr. Sue, for allowing me this moment, and thank all of you guys for giving me this time and this space to talk to you about the work that I do. Um, I am an employee in the court system and in the legal system. I've spent many years advising judges, prosecutors, law enforcement on how to best work with the community. As you might suspect that's not easy. At the same time, I've spent equal amount of effort being an artist. I got my master's degree in public policy and criminology, but I also have my master's degree in fine art and photography. And so what I've done is the last 15 years, I've put it all together. And I've never put a presentation together like this, which was to really combine both worlds. I've always presented in either the art community or the justice community. And I've always felt kind of alien to both. And I'm here today to kind of try bringing it all together. So I really, really appreciate you guys allowing me this time. This is the first time I've done this presentation. Um, so it's not gonna be long. I don't wanna take too much of your time. I wanna just be 15, 20 minutes and then I need to ask you questions. Okay, I want to have a dialogue because you guys could best inform me because I'm working with those judges and those prosecutors who need to change and who need to get some enlightenment. You guys could help me in communicating to them. So uh, we're dimming the lights because it's called, uh, next slide please, thanks. Um, it's called um, a photographic journey into the survival of the justice system. And when I mean survival, I mean the survival of me as a human having to work in that space, but also the survival of everyone who works in that space. Not just the inmates, but the judges, the attorneys, because they're losing their humanity also. So let me just say, um, I was named after these two guys. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little photographic history of, of, of my life in, in the beginning here. Um, I was named after these two people, Camilo Torres on the left, the Colombian priest, revolutionary priest in the 1950s. And then there's Camilo Cienfuegos on the right with that big old stogie, beautiful stogie, which uh, I would smoke if I could right now. Um, that's Camilo Torres who was a general in Che Guevara's and Fidel Castro's Cuban Revolutionary Army. My parents um, were radicals in the civil rights movement and the Chicano movement here in LA during the 1960s. My parents actually met here at Cal State LA. So there's good energy here. <laughs> my father was a radical, there he is right there. Um, my first memory of him, and he's a lawyer, that's him as a lawyer. My first memory of him was beating the living daylights out of a police officer here in LA. Um, my first memory of him. And it was because the cops came to our grandmother's house in Highland Park and um, basically told them to turn the music down. And of course, he's playing mariachis and he's drinking and he's smoking weed and he's partying and enjoying his culture and the fact that he was a lawyer leading his community. 
So he was a very intense man. And uh, basically after that fight, they had to run him into the hills of LA to hide him from the LAPD. But back then, the LAPD had single guys in cars. And I remember the, the cop saying, all right, let's duke it out, Richard, let's do this. And my dad beat the shit out of him. <laughs> um, that's him on the right as a law student at Loyola Law School. And he led a movement called Catholicos por la Raza, which meant Catholics for the people. And his effort was to try changing the corruption or the emphasis of the Catholic Church at the time so that they could be fo focused more on the Mexican-American community, the east side. They're building all these new churches on the west side, but the east side is where the action's at. That's where all the, all the Catholics were at. So, next slide, please. Then my mom, uh, Rosa Martinez, you know, runs away around the same time from New York City. Um, she comes to LA to be a model. Um, and she wants to be an actress and a model here in Hollywood. She was is Puerto Rican, ran away from the Bronx when she was 19, but then she finds my dad in the Chicago movement. <laughs> and so she's a Puerto Rican in the 1960s here in LA, calling herself Chicana. And from that moment on, if you guys are familiar with Chicano culture, Chicano history, um, it's not about if you're Mexican or not, it's about your experience growing up here as a Latino in the United States. Anyone can be Chicano. I think of Keith half the time as being Chicano. So um, that's my mom there. Next slide, please. So I grew up in a home environment that was rooted in the idea that all Chicanos and Latinos were to revolution and fight for justice. The theme for my parents was about helping groups of people, communities of people, whole landscapes of people, communities that have been oppressed and marginalized. So that's me. How cute. <laughs> My, my parents, as you could tell, hung out with some cool photographers at the time. Um, but again, they were documenting a movement in place. They were documenting a whole revolution. My father actually thought that they were going to be Cuba here. They were going to be Havana here in the 60s. They talked about who's going to be the mayor when they take over. It was, I mean, almost delusional, but you got to love it. you got to love the, the idealism and the hope for change. So... From this cute kid, this cute adorable kid, next, to that cute adorable kid. Not so adorable, is he? That was me in eighth grade. That's when I met Keith Black. He actually taught, he took that photo of me right there. That's mid 1980s. And see, from this photo, this type of work is where I started my whole career in photography. Now you may think, oh my God, what, what kind of message is in that? other than his breaking his finger trying to pick a winner, you know? <laughs> but see, I saw beauty in that. I saw a gesture in that. I saw humanity in that. I saw a finger being twisted inside of a nose. It's not just a booger. <laughs> there's digging, there's searching, there's, there's, a, there, there's a sense of, hey, let's mess around here, Keith. Here's my camera, take a, a photo of me. So as you can see, that the images I first made in my teens, I'm about to show you some eighth grade photos here. These are again, mid-1980s, E-Rock High School. As you can see, the first images I made were my most pr ex profound expression of humanity, which is me. I argue that the 80s generation, the Generation X, is actually the founder of the formal, what we call now, the selfie. So with that in mind, right? The selfie, I'm gonna take one of me right now. <laughs> as Keith takes a picture of me the way he did back in the 1980s. Of me picking my nose. So my mom's gonna be like, what the hell did you just do today? <laughs> 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 See, I argue that the selfie was created in the 1980s by kids like me. We weren't focused on the institutions. Our parents did enough to protect us, to make us feel like, hey, we can go forward and be whatever we wanted, even though there, are, or there was community oppression. Believe me, I had my struggles with drugs and alcohol. 
But it was mostly about, no, mijo, you can go be whatever you want. You could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer. You don't have to fight the same fights of racism and sexism that we had to fight. So right away it was about, in my generation, the me. And this next generation, the millennial, which a lot of you are part of, it's really the me now. The, the camera has become an extension of your body. At some point, we will have cameras in our hands at the point of birth or computer chips, things that allow us to take pictures at every moment. Next slide, please. So the photos you see here, see here are from my high school, again, about 30 years ago. I'm 44 years old right now. I started these when I was 12, 13 years old. They're from my high school, and they show my interest in connected to human beings rather than what my parents' generation was concerned with, which was to connect and uplift communities who had been forcibly silenced up until that time. We posed in, in front of cameras. We posed for real cameras with real film, whereas now, again, the camera is just a part of our bodies. Me messing around with my friends, that's all it was. Mm -hmm. The picture of me picking my nose, actually I had Keith pick his nose first, and then he took one of me. So we're just, again, messing around. This is the beginnings of the selfie. Hey, look at us, look at us. Next I grew up with the picture frame being something of unique value. Our poses, forms, and gestures communicated who we were and what we were about. Fast forward 20 years later, and I still like to study human form, but instead of focusing on, on our human gestures as they existed alone without institutions, nowadays my work goes back to the original motivation of my parents which was the institution and its impact on justice. Now I want to honor the legacy of my parents and their communities. Forceful, challenging, and powerful institutions is the work that I do now. It's a real judge and a real inmate. I work with the human form against the back backdrop of the same institutions that were protested by my parents. In order to do this, I decided to actually work in those same institutions. I would merge with the institutions that we are also hurt by and that we're here gathered here today to talk about in order to repurpose that institution as an actual canvas and background for expression and hopefully change. As a 15-year employee, I've been an employee of the LA Superior Court for 15 years, and now I'm the director of the Community Justice Initiative for the 
LA City Attorney's Office, I created many representations of real judges, litigants, clerks, inmates, attorneys, and law enforcement. I wanted to make pieces, art pieces, about the battle that rages between our personal dignity and the weakness that crushes in on us as we walk the corridors of an institution. I developed trust as an employee within the courts. I used to run around again advising them, working with judges, and so they got to know me and they allowed me um, to use the private space of justice, a place we don't use to make art. Um, they allowed me to create these images. Sitting for me in the awkward silence of a courthouse or a jail on a weekend, real agents of the justice system, not actors, exposed their existence to my camera their existence as it, be, as it feels inside a space of power that thrives upon the frailty of a human being. So as you saw, those are my, what I consider, I call them portraits. I call those portraits because they were focused on the individual humanity as they stood out from the backdrop, right? Like we see in the old classical of portraits of judges, kings, queens, they are the focus, the human body, that face is the focus. These next scenes, um, are composed of um, images depicting the relationship between the human, again, those types of people you just saw, and the institutional environment that surrounds them. So now I'm interested in this body work here of how the institution, the lights, the marble walls, the jail cells, how it interacts with the body. Next, please. For me, the justice system is a stage for both a theater of the absurd and a theater of the rational. I would direct subjects in what I call, these are called micro performances to display the discomfort we all silently feel as our voices are hushed by the institutional forces governing our lives.
Over the years, as I worked at the Superior Court and walked the hallways during my lunch time or break time or even just a time to get away, I witnessed impoverished litigants at the mercy of money-driven attorneys. I saw black and brown babies crawling unattended on marble floors. I saw sheriff deputies flirting with teenage girls. I once saw a short man reading the palm of a tall, attractive woman outside of a death penalty proceeding. But, the cameras are but because cameras are prohibited in this space, I was forced to create this photography during evening and on weekends. I would write notes and create musings, illustrations, fantasies, and mental paintings so that I could recreate what I saw in the courthouse after everyone had gone home. Again, these are all composed and um, done on a weekend or after hours because I couldn't do it during the daytime. As we know, the American criminal justice system is ground zero for absurdity. But absurdity is where the truth about our complexities reside. Absurdity is where the action is at. From the faulty legal decisions and countless administrative errors taking place inside our houses of justice, to the imperfection, bias, and subjectivity, and the unconscious nature of man-made law, to the stripping of humanness, from the architectural space of justice, the American criminal justice system is maddening. So in order to uh, communicate truths about the folly of justice, I created photographic composites to depict the merging of our system. So again, in the beginning, you saw me taking photographs of just the individual with the backdrop. Then the second series was individual and space interacting. This series is individuals and space actually merging into one. So in order to communicate the truths about the folly of justice, I created photographic composites to depict the, merge, the mer merging of justice stakeholders into his or her institutional surroundings. In this case, I took photos of the most institutional tree you can imagine, the ficus tree. Those are always around government buildings, and I juxtaposed those with the inmates. By seeing ourselves as imperfect, within a system that likes to consider itself perfect, I strive to provoke, provoke an awakening in our subconscious and to talk about things that result in us finally redefining ourselves as a chaotic species rather than a rational one.
So this is something that's uh, more in line with today's presentation with all of you, all you guys and your interest here. Um, this is my uh, re-entry project, a collaborative arts and re-entry project for inmates in LA County jails. Um, as we all know, for the first time in more than a decade, all categories of crime have, have rose across Los Angeles in 2015. This marks the second year in a row that violent crime has increased following years of steep decline. Compounding our crime problem, and this is what we're talking about today, is America's problem with the revolving door, with seven out of every 10 felons returning to prison <coughs> within three years after their release. So in response to that, um, I created something called Portraits of Purpose uh, with the LA County Sheriff. And what I do is I work with male and female inmates in the creation of artistic portraits revealing her, his or her expressionistic response to our most fundamental questions. Our most fundamental questions is, what is my purpose as a human being? As the gentleman talked before, um, awesome panel before me, um, all you guys who are on that panel, I, may, I need to work with you. Um, who talked about it? it was Adrian uh, Reveles. That guy talked about spirit, and spirit being really the guiding force. And I agree, we can make all the changes in law and legislation, and we can do everything we can to change judges and what they do, but at the end of the day, we, all of us, have to warrior up. We have to fight what those forces are telling us to do, and it's not just people who are considered criminals, it's all of us. Whether we're eating bad food, or whether we're on Facebook too much, we're doing things that our system wants us to do, and they're not healthy. So I created something called Portraits of Purpose, and it's to ask people to define what their life's purpose is. Um, a lot of philosophers, scientists, artists today say that our civilization is going to collapse and our species is going to go extinct because of the irreversible changes we've made to our climate. In other words, the effects of human-driven global warming solidifies this epoch, this time period, as the Earth's human period. In this time of human beings, now more than ever, we have to ask ourselves, what is my purpose? And instead of asking the ivory tower, which is what we usually do, we ask our professors, we ask our leaders, we ask our teachers. Um, instead of them, I wanted to ask people who are on the fringes people in jail, um, and I want them to teach us that we got to ask that question. So, like I said, we go to the ivory towers and we say, hey, judge, cop, philosopher, professor, tell us what to do, tell us how to think. Um, those of us who are free but are, are bound by the desires to consume, though. Prisoners, however, are emancipated from that greed and the conditioning of consumerism. The incarcerated actually have the time to consider the most urgent questions of today. And Portraits of Purpose strives to harness these moments. Those are very precious moments in jail, and I could imagine the guys who were in that, that uh, panel before me could, could agree that those are some precious moments you gotta harness. Because recidivism can only stop if a more profound understanding of life is enveloped in the soul of the quote-unquote criminal. By utilizing the questions of climate change, what I want to do is bring a philosophical approach rooted in the question of our existence to restorative justice and reentry in the hopes of preventing ongoing recidivism among a broadening population of the incarcerated. Um, so that's it. Those are my images. I'm going to say a couple more words and then I'm going to ask some questions to you guys because this here is, I've done it twice. And I want to get your real feedback. Um, I went to art school, so I'm not uh, I'm not touchy when it comes to critique. We had some major fights and critiques, and those are the best times. But what these are, um, and you can't really read the writings, but those are what they describe to be their life purpose. And I basically photograph them as they read their life purpose, as they write about it, as they enact it, as they gesture about it, as they perform it. I basically do that in the jail with them. 
I give them the pieces afterwards, and I want to give them to their families and say, don't forget that wonderful moment that you harnessed in jail. Because the next time, you know, I'm thinking of wallet-sized pieces for their wallet, the next time they may grab their wallet to get some money out to go do some dirt or whatever, they can grab that out instead. And so the hope is to give them this one artistic moment, capture it in jail, and hopefully they can use that as a, speed, as a seed for spirit that we talked about earlier. So just let me sum up, and then I got a question or two. Um, so I work deep in the justice system as an artist and as an administrator. I see firsthand that our government, and I see when I say firsthand, I talk about chambers of, and judges for judges and, and police stations. I see that our government not only carries out violence, but it is highly unaware of its own fear. Government is aware, is unaware of its own fear, which is to me at the core of violence. I think there's an unspoken turmoil lying right underneath our courthouses and jails. This daunting nature of the system forces me to feel as if I'm trapped inside the same concrete walls that my employer condemns convicted criminals to. Even though I'm regarded or even though I'm, I'm free to, to come and go from these government buildings, the absurdity of this space we call justice feels profoundly confining and reminds me that we do not need to be in jail physically to be in prison. But while this incarceration and chaos surrounds me at the court and in my office at City Hall, so does the prospect of freedom. Indeed, these walls of my employment are meant to remind me that something else exists beyond those walls. While the feeling of imprisonment underscores my experience and the experience of so many others working inside this justice system, I am constantly searching for freedom in this same space, even though I'm regarded a free man. This source of freedom is my artistic engagement with my world that I present to you today. Thank you.